I stumbled upon the work of Kavita Bedford in a newspaper article. She had written about the launch of her latest novel, Friends and Dark Shapes, but the article was just as much a love letter to Sydney, a city that, at times, refused to love her back. Bedford wanted to write about Sydney in the way that authors have long written about their hometowns. She wanted to capture a sense of the place, the shape of it, the way it builds and breaks people, and the way it built and broke her. This is the world according to Kavita Bedford. Friends in Dark Shape starts with a group of friends moving into a share house in Redfern, a trendy inner city suburb in Sydney with a long history tied to the indigenous rights movement. The housemates are all eccentric in their own way. The protagonist is an aspiring writer, while another housemate is an aspiring musician, and still another, an aspiring actor. The last is simply an aspiring appreciator of the arts. They all share the tag aspiring, along with the same age bracket of late 20s, and most importantly, a growing, gnawing feeling that they are outsiders in their own city. Kavita Bedford's novel peels back the glamour of Sydney, a glamour that shines out of the coastal beaches and skyscrapers, and tries to understand the city for what it really is, a place of confusing contradictions, a place that is at once naturally beautiful and yet increasingly synthetic and artificial, laid back and yet increasingly racist, full of awe and yet full of exclusionary concentric social circles. Thing is, this is a beautiful city, he says, but a lot of people say there is something off here and that it is difficult to connect with others. Sydney, despite its beauty, has never made me feel settled in my bones. Sure, its landscape informs my being, but it is not a city in tune with my internal rhythms. This is an outdoor city, but we keep our desires, our doubts, our hearts hidden behind locked screen doors. We have parks, we have space, we gorge on natural beauty, weekend coastal walks, beers by the beach, dog walks in the sun. People walk up and down the sandy coastline, but it is so difficult to read the emotional state of the city. People keep their feelings politely locked up. We joke a lot, as though we know we're on borrowed time, on borrowed land. But I wonder how can we grieve for ourselves if our country doesn't know how to grieve its own history? The book centres on this idea of being an outsider in your own city. In another memorable scene, Bedford explores the imperative placed on immigrants to tell a certain kind of story when they arrive in Australia. They need to fit into the media narrative if they want their writing to be published at all. The protagonist, an aspiring young journalist, meets with another young female writer in a bar to discuss this. The scene is filled with moral rage at a city unwilling to accept immigrants on their own terms. They say talk about your experience, but then make sure it's categorised as an opinion piece so people really know that it has no factual bearing, and it is immediately minimised and has quotation marks around everything, and a picture of you smiling like an idiot in the byline. At the same time, Bedford has a tendency of pulling too many punches in the book. Whenever a criticism is made of Sydney, she immediately resorts to another character replying about privilege. Sure, there may be difficulties in living here, but are they worse than any other city? And look at the pretty beaches. The value of Sydney is always presented in its aesthetics. It is undeniably beautiful, but the book asks, is that enough? The beauty, for its own sake, is viscerally depicted throughout. It's in the box row terrace houses of Glebe and Redfern. It's in the golden dream of the coastline, with the beaches unfurling headland after headland as far as the eye can see. It's in the understated glow of neon lights that awaken Chinatown at midnight, and the parade through the central business district, revealing office workers in dimly lit bars, trying desperately to revive the Prohibition-style booze-ups of the 1920s. It's in the train rides home at three in the morning, returning to a sharehouse filled with other restless souls 
searching for an answer to a question that no one can quite articulate, each desperately wanting a connection to someone, each desperately wanting to be seen. Bedford loses herself in these places. Her protagonist spends weekends chasing different ocean pools and lingering in the city's festivals on long, languishing summer nights. It's here, surrounded by beauty, that the protagonist finds time to think about loss. What does it mean to live in a city so beautiful, but to miss the one person you shared it with the most? It's a hard question to answer. The protagonist has lost her father. The novel tracks this reconciliation with the past with an equally difficult attempt to build a future. The twin urges of understanding what happened and at the same time wanting to move on. The day after my dad died, I went to the ocean pool at Bronte. Sydney is littered with ocean pools. They sit safely nestled away from the hazardous waves. The day was heavy and humid and it stuck to my skin as I waited for the summer storm to hit. The clouds thickened and darkened, the air swelled, the ocean churned. I dived into the water. Sea urchins and anemones and small fish danced below me. The personal tragedy of the protagonist is mixed up with the tragedy of the city itself. Sydney is a city with a dark past, a past filled with the deaths of the indigenous populations, that used to live on its now celebrated coves and coastlines. The city has yet to come to term with this deeper loss. The two stories play out in parallel in the book, with the book hinting that a reconciliation with the past is essential before one can build a future. It is not enough to have beauty without understanding the past of those who appreciated it before you and those who were killed in its shadow. Nikki and I walk back from Redfern Station. The painting on the wall across from Redfern Station is in earthy colours and reads, 40,000 years is a long time, 40,000 years still on my mind. The indigenous protesters near our house will be pushed out of their camp a couple of months later, and this block of land too will house new stories and lives. The language of a city is all around us, if we choose to read it, call it what you want. Hauntings, ghosts, or memories, they are the same thing. The novel reminds me of another love letter to Sydney, written by the architect Elizabeth Forelli for her most recent book called Appropriately Killing Sydney. Forelli talks about how the history of the city is being demolished block by block, replaced by an indistinguishable modern architecture. It is the architectural equivalent of erasing the past, which is where the killing comes into it. How can we face a past that no longer even exists in physical space? She writes of her first impression of the city in glowing terms. I can still taste my first breath of Sydney. It was October 1978. I was 21. This place with its shifting, salted air tangled fabric, voluptuous topography, winding muscular flora and glorious chiaroscuro light seemed to me the most thrilling, most picturesque, most romantic city on earth. I walked the length of Oxford Street, crusted with its tiny left bank cafes and boutiques set around leafy courtyards, bespoke jewelers that glittered in the morning and mad milliners that glowed transparent in the dusk. For almost a week I lived in a century-old Balmain share house whose spindly-legged balcony hung over the footpath like some snippet of Istanbul. I loved Sydney, deeply, unreservedly, and at once. It seemed miraculous to me that such a place existed, combining the crabbiness of old Europe with a South Pacific sinuosity. But the city that she loved increasingly came under threat from new development. The alleyways and shops gave way to large apartment complexes and shopping malls. The texture of the city, the affordability, began to shift and change. She explains this shift in terms of an ecosystem, changing and adapting to different patterns. Think of the city as a coral reef, a complex conglomerate of forms and spaces designed if designed is the word, to accommodate a vast plurality of life forms. 
some sedentary, some motile, in a myriad of niches. The reef is made of stuff. It's an object with form and texture and surface that collects sunlight and grows food. But in many ways, the purpose of those forms is to create the spaces between. When we start demolishing large sections of the reef, we interrupt and destroy its history, obliterating character for smooth lines and skyscrapers, getting rid of the space between things. From both Bedford and Forelli, I get the conclusion that beauty is not enough. If beauty is merely there to replace and hide the dark of the past, then what use is it really for, and who benefits from it? Living in Sydney requires a greater reckoning than a mere appreciation for how beautiful the city can be. It requires a reckoning with what that beauty hides, and who is excluded, and ultimately, a reckoning with what that hiding says about us as a people.